Good morning, everyone. And Happy New Year. <laughs> Welcome to the first Sunday service of 2022. We're glad to see you. Um, let's start uh, today with some welcome um, and announcements. So first, if you turn to everybody and say hi and spread some joy this first Sunday. <clears throat> okay, so we have some announcements this morning. Uh, first thing is that there will be an elders meeting today after church, so if elders would please make your way to whatever room you're meeting at. Um, that would be appreciated. Um, and we have some additions to the prayer list. Would you please keep Arlene Cripp's son Johnny in your prayers? He's been um, intubated with double pneumonia and COVID, so he's in desperate need of our prayers so that he gets well. Um, Bumper DeLuca, he is home, and uh, he continues to be in some pain, but we are asking for continued prayers for him and the rest of the DeLuca family as he continues um, his process in getting better. And I have um, an announcement that um, Eddie Hardwick's brother Russ has passed and the service will be this Tuesday in the church and information on time and everything will be um, on Lee Wooster's website. And also on our prayer list is Jennifer McBride's friend Pete. He also passed this past week. So if you'd please keep the Hardwick and the Millette families in your prayers. Um, as you know, it's a very hard time losing somebody during a holiday season. So um, please keep them in your prayers this week. Uh, I think that's all the announcements we have for this morning. So if you'll please bow your heads, let's have a prayer together. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing everyone here today into your house of worship. We are glad to celebrate a new year with the people that we love. And though we may have resolutions, may the first resolution be that we come closer to you this year, 2022, and that we find peace in our surroundings and in your word and that the world finds peace, that everybody remains healthy and strong, and that we spread your word to others. Amen. Okay. Um, if you'll please open your hymn books to 148. That's 148. We'll sing our first song, We Three Kings of Orient Are.
Next, we'll have the scripture reading from John chapter 1, verse 14. It's page 1,259 in your Bible. A little unprepared today, so there we go. Okay. Uh, Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's stand and sing again, Good Christian Men Rejoice, hymn 132. give our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
Let's stand and sing our doxology together. Next up, we'll have some special music from Lori. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. meant to be with God as my father neighbors all are we let us walk with each other in perfect harmony let begin with me let this be the moment now with every step i take let this be my karma's vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally It begin with me. through uh, the elders collection.
we thank you, Lord, for these gifts that we may uh, use them to help others in need. And we ask these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us your word. As we open up your holy scriptures, fill us with the Holy Spirit and open our minds and our hearts to what you have for us. Please let your word come alive in us. Open doors for us this new year to share your love with others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, Happy New Year. We are going to get to 1 John. I don't know if we'll get through the whole first chapter or not because I'm going to spend a lot of time on the introduction and, and on verse 1, which is very powerful. But uh, a couple of things. Uh, Pam and I flew down to Alabama Monday, uh, this past Monday and came back yesterday um, to see family, which was wonderful. But my prayer life got a lot better last night. We had a direct flight booked, and they changed it to connecting flights, so we were flying in puddle jumpers. And, and I don't fit real well in... In, in puddle jumpers and all that. So um, we're flying back from, D, from D.C. to Philly, and the uh, pilot announces, put your trade table up, shut your electronic voices off, we're going to be landing soon in Philadelphia. And I don't see anything out the window. I just see fog. And I'm like, oh, man. So I'm praying and praying. And then it's like 20 minutes since he announced it. I was like, we got to be getting close to the ground. This is, uh, this is like a Twilight Zone movie. And... Uh, with that, all of a sudden, I mean, not less than 10 feet from the runway, it appears. So praise the Lord for good pilots and good navigational system. And so my, my faith was really strong. Uh, I don't know about you guys. I, I don't make New Year's resolutions anymore, but I do reflect on the old year and try to make some changes. Um, by end of day yesterday, I blew three of the things I was trying to change. I'm not going to touch on two of them, but one of them I will. Uh, we get home pretty late last night. We unpack and everything, and Pam says she's going to bed. So I figured, let me just sit and watch some TV and unwind a little bit. And one of the things I said I was going to do is lay off of junk food. I'm addicted to, like, those Goldenberg peanut chews, uh, Reese's, uh, candy. I'm addicted to that stuff. So I'm doing great all day, you know, and, and uh and I'm sitting there, and one of our daughters had given us this really nice gift basket. It's right next to where I sit. I said, oh, let me see what's in that. And that's how temptation starts, doesn't it? Well, there's a little bag of mini, or, mini mint Oreos dipped in dark chocolate. Oh, I put a hurting on those puppies. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you, it, it's, it shows me why my salvation is not dependent on me. Right? I mean, I didn't make it 24 hours. I mean, it's crazy, right? So my salvation is dependent wholly on God. Our salvation is dependent. We can't do anything to earn it, can we? So amen to that. So that was some good life lessons. So the reason I want to look at First John, there's two, two of Jesus' disciples whom I particularly like to, to have known in their days of, uh, on, the earth, on their earthly life. One of them, as you know, is Peter, because I identify a lot with Peter. And the other is John. I really like these two guys, uh, especially the, I'm especially impressed by the change that, fe that the fellowship with our Lord Jesus produced in their lives. And what is the change with you fellowshipping with the Lord doing in your life? Is it changing you? It should continue to change us every day, shouldn't it? This is what intrigues me about these two guys. First, Peter, as you know, was erratic, impulsive, brash. And someone well said, whenever Peter enters a scene, it's always with a thud. So I have that problem a lot also. He seems to have a, a gift for putting his foot in his mouth. He suffered from hoof and mouth disease, as I do often. Yet the Lord made him a steady, stable, dependable rock, as his name implies. He became a rallying point, a gathering point for Christians in the days of persecution, which broke out in the first century. It was only because he was with the Lord and knew the Lord. Most of the change took place after the Lord's death and resurrection and after the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We need the Holy Spirit, don't we? 
Uh, so we, do, we don't need to feel that it was the personal presence of Jesus that changed these men. He changed them after he died and rose again, just as he can change us. John was the other one who was dramatically changed by the Lord. He was a young man, the youngest of all the disciples. In fact, many scholars feel that he was a teenager when he first met, started to follow the Lord. Perhaps he was 17 or 18 years of age. Along with his brother James, he was a hot-headed, and unfortunately I can identify with that too, young man, given to sharp and impulsive utterances with a tendency toward blowing off steam. He was probably a loud mouth. No comment, Pam. Okay. Because Jesus nicknamed him the Son of Thunder. That was our Lord's gentle way of labeling John's problem. He just kept the thunder rolling all the time. So our Lord called both James and John the son of, sons of thunder. But John became the apostle of love. He was noted for his gentleness and his graciousness and his goodness. He was called the virgin. As far as we know, he never married. There is no record that he ever did. But he was called the virgin primarily because of the purity of his life. He, was a, he became a man who was characterized by such an outstanding devotion and love for the Lord Jesus that all his life he was singled out as the apostle of love. That's what I want to be known as. When I die, I want, it, I want them to know that people to say, he loved the Lord, he loved his family, and he loved others. Not that he was a loud mouth or he ate too many Oreos or anything else, right? We're going to look at 1 John 1 this morning, which can be found on page 1446 in the Pew Bibles. Now, it is this John who writes these letters to us. You may know that this first letter of John is possibly the last of the New Testament writ to be written. It may well have been written after the Gospel of John. It is perhaps therefore the last word we have from, uh, from the apostles. It undoubtedly comes from near the close of the first century, perhaps even after 100 AD. As some scholars tell us, it was written from the city of Ephesus where John spent the latter years of his life. It was possibly written to the, it, it was possibly written to the Christians in the city of Ephesus who were facing, much as we are today, dangers and difficulties of living in a godless, pagan world given over to the worship of sex and licentious practices, lovers of human wisdom, lovers of human wisdom. Unfortunately, that's where we are today, aren't we? As all of these Greek cities were, and especially this, uh, the, the desires of exalting man and his abilities. We're putting the created above the creator, aren't we? That's the worship that we're following in this world today. It sounds very familiar like our modern Western world, doesn't it? As I've said many times, I believe the biggest false doctrine we face today is the God of self. First John was written to people in this kind of situation then, and therefore it has a lot to say to us today. John is led of God to call people back, what's re to, to re back to what's really important, the things that make for real life. So he is concerned about authentic Christian manifestation and authentic Christianity is always made up of the same four elements. The body of this letter of 1 John is an emphasis upon three of these essential things that make Christian, Christianity genuinely Christian. Are you genuinely Christian to your neighbors, to your loved ones, to people at work? There's a lot of people stressed out today, aren't they? I mean, financially, COVID, all this stuff, are you the rock they turn to? We should be, shouldn't we? We need to exude that confidence in the Holy Spirit and love people, don't we? Okay. They, the three things are, are truth, righteousness, and love, which are evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. These held in perfect balance are a sign of genuine Christianity. These become, therefore, the marks that John emphasizes as proof to anyone that he or she is a Christian. The letter gives us a wonderful measuring stick whereby we can test our own lives. How are we doing? Do we fulfill the qualifications? Do we manifest truth, righteousness, and love? Has there been a noticeable change in our lives after we accepted the Lord? Are we growing in our walk with the Lord? That's a great thing to ask the second day of the new year, isn't it? John gives us a prelude 
which is really the key to the way truth, righteousness, and love can be made manifest in your life. There is a relationship that is necessary. Just like I can't avoid many chocolate-covered mint Oreos, right, without a lot of intercession and help, we can't display those three things without the Holy Spirit, can we? We need that, right? That relationship, John, terms fellowship with Christ, oneness with him, an identification of your life with Jesus Christ. Now, if you do not have that, you cannot produce righteousness, truth, and love. It's impossible to do it, isn't it? I didn't make it 12 hours. Someone has said it is, impo- it, it is possible to search through all the writings of Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Confucius, Buddha, Dr. Phil, whoever, other world leaders of moral and ethical thought, to find everything that is written in the New Testament that exhorts man as to what to do. In other words, if all you need is good advice, you don't need the Bible. You can get plenty of good advice from these other religions or people. But one thing that that these other leaders do not give you is how. How. That is what John's talking about here. He's given us the how to do it, okay? As you know, I was blessed to have worked for a gentleman years ago that said the best self-help book ever written is the book of Proverbs. He encouraged us to read a chapter every day. So how do you follow this good advice? We all know the golden rule. You can find a version of the golden rule in a negative form in many other religions. Do not do to others as you do not want them to do to you. Ah, but in Christ, you find the secret of how. It is by unity with him, union with him, fellowship with the Lord Jesus, he dwelling in you and you dwelling in him. That is what John begins, begins to talk about. John wrote this letter in, def- in defense against uh, the heresy of the day, which was called Gnosticism, whose false doctrines can be found in many of the false religions today. Here's a short list of those, those false beliefs. Number one, knowledge is superior to virtue. Sound familiar? Right? The wise become dumb, don't they? I, I remember a buddy of mine, his father was the janitor in our school. And they wanted to put a new rope on our flagpole. You've heard me tell the story before. And they got the geometry teacher out there. They got everybody out there trying to figure out how much rope they need to put a new rope on the flagpole. He goes out there and he tapes his tape measure on the rope, on the existing rope, runs it up and says, double that, you should be good. Right? They're out there for hours trying to do all the math and the trigonometry and everything else. <laughs> I mean, I, I just I died laughing. I just thought it was hysterical. Okay, So knowledge is superior to virtue is one of the beliefs. The non-literal sense of scripture is correct and can be understood only by a select few. When someone tells you the Bible can only be understood by the elitist, be careful, run away. The third one is evil in the world precludes God's being the only creator. The fourth one is the incarnation is not credible because deity cannot unite itself with anything material such as a body. I love when people put limitations on God, right? I remember reading in the Old Testament where they put the tabernacle in with the uh, Philistines' gods and the tabernacle of God destroyed the Philistines' wooden gods and and the Philistines came out and complained, complained, your God beat up our gods. I was like, well, if their gods can be beat up so easy or burned in fire or melted, how can they be a God, right? Anyway. There's no resur- the fifth one is there's no resurrection of the, fled- and of the flesh denying the atoning significance of Jesus' death and resurrection. The ethical standards of many Gnostics were very low, much like so many people in the world today. So John emphasized the reality of the incarnation and the high ethical standards of earthly life of Christ. So, okay, let's look at John 1.1. 1, 1. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this first verse. It's very powerful. Verse 1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. What was from the beginning? As in John's gospel, John begins this letter with the word, the embodiment of God's revelation in the person of Jesus Christ. Notice the word, word, is capitalized. Why is that capitalized? Because it's the name of God. Okay, So I'm so thankful God the Holy Spirit has led us to study this scripture. The timing could not be better. 
We just celebrated the birth of our Savior. What are we really celebrating? We are celebrating that the Word, God, became flesh, as we read in uh, John 1.14. Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. He was tempted in all the same ways we are, but never sinned. He never gave in to those Oreos. Right? That's, that's pretty powerful in my book. Right? He had to, ha- had, to be perfect, had to be the perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. John gives proof of this in both the Gospel of John and in his letters. He tells us that Jesus had to be perfect, fully God and fully man, or there would be no atonement for our sins. John immediately states his thesis. Not only was Jesus from the beginning eternal, he was also able to be heard, seen, and touched. He was human. If you can, please turn to the book of John, chapter 1, page 1259 in the Pew Bibles. John, chapter 1. 1251 in the Pew Bible. I'd like to read the first five verses, and just read along with me if you can. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The world cannot comprehend Jesus Christ, can they? because they're so dependent on themselves. They are their own God. So now let's look a few verses further at John 1.14, which we read earlier. This is the Christmas story, John 1.14. This is the true Christmas story. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen? Every morning, I get a little devotional, if you will, on my phone at 7 a.m. Here is what it said Christmas Eve morning. In Jesus Christ, God wrapped himself in flesh, then wrapped himself in death. He is the present that opens up heaven, and in him alone, heaven's presence on earth is open to us. Let me read that again. In Jesus Christ, God wrapped himself in flesh and then wrapped himself in death. He is the present that opens up heaven, and in him alone, heaven's presence on earth is open to us. Pretty powerful. This is the real Christmas story, isn't it? Yes, two of the Gospels give us a great description of the birth of Jesus. So let's ask ourselves, why was Jesus born? Right? Was he born that we could have Christmas, and trees, and lights, and beautiful poinsettias and things like that? No. He was born to go to the cross. Jesus was born to die for our sins, to pay the price we could not on the third day and defeat, and on the third day, defeat death for all of us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, of Jesus the Christ, the death has been defeated. Death has been defeated, right? Eddie, I think of Russ. Man, let me tell you something. It can't get any better than that. I mean, he's rejoicing. I mean, it's all new. It's, it's brand new. I think of so many loved ones. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, death has no sting. Okay? That's something to rejoice for, isn't it? Okay. I hope you all understand that's good news, right? That is what Pastor Dave was referring to each Sunday when he entered with this saying, the best is yet to come, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 58 is the real reason we celebrate the birth of our Savior. I was going to have you turn to it, but in the matter of time, I'll, I'll just read it. So it's 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 58. If you want to look at it, it's 1371 in your pew Bibles. Verse 53. For this perishable, this perishable, right, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, 
Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. If not for the birth of our Savior, we could not say death is, the, is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? That's some great hope, isn't it? No wonder the world's crazy. They don't have that hope. I'd be crazy to, crazier, right? For those of us that are not nearing the end of our, that, that are nearing the end of our earthly walk and walking with the Lord, the word becoming flesh and walking among us and conquering the grave through the resurrection assures us that physical death of this earthly shell will have no sting or victory. That is good news. Amen. I love Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. I'll read it to you. It's Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to the angels, but gives help to the descendants of Abraham. That's us, right? And in verse 17, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. That's why he was 100% flesh, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Verse 18, for since he himself was tempted in that which he, was, he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. How great is that? We have an intercessor that was fully human and tempted in all the ways we are. In my simple mind, I think of it kind of like an addictions ministry or programs that assign sponsors. Why? Because they've been through it, right? They know. This is a great place to start your relationship with, our, with your Lord and Savior. You know, I, we have, Pam and I were blessed with four wonderful children. One of our children wanted to go out one night to a party, and we did not want them to go. And we said, no, nope, you cannot go. So we would have a buy level. So I knew they were going to sneak out. I just knew it. Why? Because that's what I would have done. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the, I'm standing in the bush against the house, and I hear the window open, <laughs> and I feel the foot come down on my head. <laughs> now they're stuck. I wanted to go around and close the window on them and just leave them there. But, but I couldn't. They're stuck, right? They got to come out. They're caught. They're done, right? The Lord knows us, doesn't he? Right? Okay. So this is a great place to start in your relationship with your Lord and Savior. There is no reason to try to hide anything or try to deceive him. He has lived it and he has seen it all. So start your walk with him by being honest. So that's a great way to start the new year, right? Confess your sins. He knows them anyway. He's standing under the bush. He's waiting for your foot to come down and say, hello, what are you going to do now? Right? So ask for forgiveness and thank him for his love. Then demonstrate your love and gratefulness by walking with him. Right? He desires obedience over sacrifice. So let's look at this. In the beginning was the word, right? John 1 told us that. The word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That was John 1, 14. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. That's 1 John 5, 7. He is clothed with, with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Revelation 19, 13. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit 
of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrew 4.12. He's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So we might as well be honest with him, right? There are three ways we get to know God. The first is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is the cornerstone or the key. Next is studying the word of God. It is great to read the Bible through in a year. I love people that we do that. In addition to that, get yourself a good study Bible. There are some great resources available for free online. Then take a verse or a chapter or a book of the Bible and really break it down and study it. I don't recommend you begin in like Leviticus or whatever though, okay? The, the Holy Spirit will really open it up for you and the word will become alive in your life. The third is prayer. We cannot pray enough, can we? Prayer is the glue that holds it all together. A dear brother in the Lord sent me this the other day. Let's compare prayer to an automobile. Prayer is the engine, not the spare tire. Many times my prayer life can be like my spare tire. I only think about it and use it after I have a flat. Amen? How many of us pray after? Right? We're supposed to pray before, during, and after, aren't we? My prayer life's really good after. It's a shame. I use my spare tire a lot. Okay, not this one. The one in the car. <laughs> okay. That's verse 1. Let's quickly go through some of the other verses. In verse 2, 1 John 1, chapter 1, verse 2. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. The life was manifested. Eternal life is revealed to humanity in the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This echoes John 1.14 that we've been uh, dwelling on today, where the Word, who was with God and was God, became flesh and dwells with humanity as Jesus. This is a life-giving proclamation. Verse 3. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John is reassuring his followers and, and us readers of this letter, a letter that he is giving a first-hand eyewitness account to support his defense against false, uh, false do- teachings. Remember, church tradition teaches us that Rome tried to boil John in oil. They put him in a big vat of boiling oil, and he wouldn't boil. He's just in there walking around, no big deal. So they banished him to the island of Patmos for years, and then in his later lives, he finished up in Ephesus, and that's where he was. But, I mean, they couldn't kill this guy. So pretty, pretty amazing. Verse 4, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Do you want your joy to be made complete? Have a relationship with your Savior. That's what he wants, okay? Our joy may be made complete. If we, it will be complete by ensuring the spiritual health of this Christian community that John loves. In verses 5 through 10, John exhorts us to exhibit the attributes of God, honoring Jesus and what the free gift of the cross really costs. So in verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light. I thought that was powerful. A common metaphor in the Old Testament and Jewish literature for for God's perfection. God's light serves as a beacon for the righteousness and leads others to him. I remember the story of a a, a, a guy's in a ship and he's flashing his lights because he sees a light off in the distance. And and he says, uh, sir, whoever you are, you need to go to starboard and we'll go to port. And the other one says, no, you need to go to, you need to, go to starboard. And, and they go back and forth and back and forth. And finally, the ship says, this is the, the mighty battleship USS Iowa. You need to go to port. And the other one says, this is the lighthouse. You need to go to port now. <laughs> so, so we need to be focused on the light, don't we? All right. So we're all familiar with Psalm 27.1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? not even death, right? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, 
we lie and do not practice the truth. Boy, John cuts it really to the edge, doesn't he? Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, he himself is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, I hate to say it, but that's why we are at enmity with the world. There's rubbing and there's chafing, and there should be. You should feel like you're swimming upstream when you're out in the world with those that don't know the Lord. But you need to love them, and you need to share the gospel, because the light exposes, doesn't it? Okay? I really like the New Living Translation for verses 5 through 7. Then I'll read them for you. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I'm so thankful for verses 8 through 10 that we're going to look at here. Even after we, we are saved, and even after walking with, our Lord, with the Lord for years, we still sin, don't we? I still fall to those Oreos, don't I? All right? This means yes, okay? We still sin, don't we? Yes. 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 I, I have to check with Pam. <laughs> we should be sinning less, though, shouldn't we? And bearing the fruit of the Spirit. But we still need to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. That is why salvation is not based on us being good or perfect. That is why only Jesus, holy man and holy God, was the perfect sacrifice, paying the penalty for our sins, and God offering us the free gift of eternal life with him in heaven. All we have to do is accept the free gift, right? What good's a Christmas gift if you don't accept it? Okay? Okay. Can, then we need to confess our sins, ask for forgiveness, and walk with him. I would like to close by reading verses 8 through 10 as our benediction this morning. So, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteousness to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we have made him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen? Great message for Communion Sunday, isn't it? So as Jeff's going to lead us in communion, I just ask that you reflect on that, that it's a free gift. I encourage you to accept that gift and look and think about what these elements represent, okay? Thank you very much. As we uh, gather here to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we just uh, praise him for what he's done for us. The reason for communion is explained in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, and 29. The purpose for the uh, communion is for us to reflect on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And this is open to all members of the church as long as you are a believer in Jesus Christ. do not need to be a member of this church to take communion, but you do, do need to personally claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We will not judge you, but I, I ask that you follow what the, is said in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. And 23 and 24 
it says, for the bread, and then again, one's elders will pray for the bread, and I am going to pray for the bread before we start. Uh, everyone can take their communion combination here and peel up the top layer for the wafer. As we take this wafer, we remember that it is a remembrance that Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins through his body. And this wafer reminds us of his bodily Savior, what he's done. Heavenly Father, as we take this, in remembrance of you on how your body was broken. We just give you praise, honor, and glory for what you did for us on the cross. We thank you for the salvation you brought to our lives. As a believer, we take this bread in remembrance of you. As we prepare to take the cup, I want to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 down through 26. For I have received of the Lord that Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, which we just did, and when he had given thanks, we broke it and we took it. After this, in the same manner, we also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, that ye that do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, as we take this cup, we just give you praise, honor, and glory for everything you've done in our lives. We thank you especially for our salvation, whichever time in our life it may have come. Some as a young child, some as a mid-age, mid and some others in their older age. Father, again, we give you praise for that. Now you can take the cup. Heavenly Father, as we have completed the communion service, we give you praise, we give you the honor you deserve, and we just thank you, Father, for everything you've done in our lives. Father, as we complete this, we just walk out of this service refreshed in knowing that you are our Savior and you glorify our lives, and we pray for that. We will now uh, sing uh, 118, 
as we uh, finish this service, we just praise that you bless everything that we've heard today from uh, Mike, and that we may apply it to our lives and do what you want. And Father, any of us that do not know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that you come and take that as a message that you can accept him as Lord and Savior and that he comes into your life and saves you. Amen. Amen.